Well, I'm turning it over to Eric Leland, our presenter for today. Thank you so much. All right, excellent. Um, thanks, everybody, for making the time today. Um, got a great uh, webinar um, and great conversation. I hope we'll have uh, today on some uh, technology topics and some trends um, and how they affect the uh, legal services community. So looking forward to it. Let's uh, start some uh, introductions here. First of all, on a technical note, um, I'm not going to do full screen presentation. I'm going to do most screen presentations. So you will see uh, some uh, navigation items on the left and right. That just allows me to do a little bit more quicker without bothering you with a lot of painful waiting time. Um, so if you want to just focus in on the slides themselves, that's great. Um, that'll help me out a lot. Um, just some introductions uh, quickly who I am. Uh, this is my uh, blurry picture. Um, and uh, my name is Eric Leland. I'm an expert trainer of Idealware. I'm also a principal with Five Paths LLC. Um, been with Idealware for the, more than 10 years, doing a lot of work on webinars, a lot of these presentations, a lot of research on web software trends, uh, donor software. I'm happy to be here. And at Five Paths, we do a lot of consulting with nonprofit organizations on technology strategy, websites, and databases. So that's me. Um, more importantly, I would say we have uh, two uh, folks here that are um, uh, quite um, expert in the legal services area, and we'll be offering a lot of commentary on the various topics we have today. Uh, first is uh, Angela, um, Angela Tripp. I'm wondering if, Angela, you could uh, introduce yourself. Sure. I'm the project manager of the Michigan Legal Help Program, um, which is Michigan's website and self-help center resources for people representing themselves in um, civil legal matters. Um, I've been with legal services of some kind or another for 12 years, and I've been working exclusively on Michigan Legal Help um, for about the last four years. Great. Thanks, Angela. Um, and we also have uh, Brian Rowe um, here uh, that will be offering a lot of commentary as well on the various slides. Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm the project manager at LSNTAP, the National Technology Assistance Project. Um, I've also worked in web design for about 10 years before going to law school. I was a coder doing mostly web design work. Awesome. Very good. Well, what we have today is a, a, a good format. Um, there's three of us here today um, to talk about uh, various topics, trends, um, uh, in uh, web te technologies, and specifically what we're going to be focusing on today um, is some storytelling topics specifically through images. We want to look at um, some trends around using images on websites. Um, and I want to look to uh, Angela and Brian to help fill in you know, where that's working well and poorly um, in um, legal services communities and provide some commentary there from their direct experience. Uh, we'll also be covering um, more on the technical side, looking at mobile, some of the trends in mobile uh, happening on the web, uh, and see uh, you know, how folks are using mobile and approaching that uh, through websites, how that affects the uh, legal services community as well. Um, and then a focus on, on content, um, strategies and, and strengths and techniques um, around using content on the web. Um, and we can talk through a little bit about how that applies specifically to uh, legal services communities. Um, in getting better, stronger content um, and getting it out there in, in front of folks. Uh, the format, basically, uh, I'd like to sort of uh, take the high level and introduce some of the, the slides as we go through it and then ask uh, Brian and Angela, ask both of you to sort of uh, uh, comment and, and provide some insight uh, underneath that. And I'll help try to regulate time as well. So if you see me inter interrupting or, or moving us forward, that's one of my roles, so I'll be doing that as well. Um, and then all of us can kind of monitor your questions, folks on this call, so you can chat them in. Um, and Brian, I believe folks can unmute themselves as well and talk if they need to. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Brian maybe unmute himself. That, that's um, definitely correct. I'm trying to help somebody else get on the audio. That's oh, no Definitely worries. correct. Um, if okay. you're on a landline, star six will mute or unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, there's a mute and unmute button you know, for the voice over IP. If we get background noise, we'll have to mute everyone, and um, you can use the chat channel uh, to speak up if you're on voice over IP. Thanks. 
Very good. Um, yeah, so feel free to use the, use the chat um, uh, option. Um, that will be uh, easiest, but you can also uh, ask your questions audibly as well as long as you use star six to unmute um, or unmute your own phone. Excellent. I think we're ready to, to dive in here. Um, let's look at uh, the first area here, images for storytelling. Uh, first of all, one of the big trends that I'm, I'm sure we've all seen uh, having navigated sites in the last uh, couple years especially um, is this trend around um, big central images. Um, this is a great example, classic example. Um, a, what we're talking about here are trends where websites, especially the, the home page, but often and, and more often inside pages have a substantial amount of real estate, often more than half, three quarters in this case, um, real estate devoted to a, a single image. Um, it's meant to um, provide a sort of a, a visceral, immediate communication of a central message. It's meant to um, be emotive and be motivating and captivating. So uh, the, I, the game, of course, with websites is to try to get not only understanding around a message, but to get some action. Um, and these kinds of images um, are, are you know, purporting to do that. Now there's some debate, um, and I'm curious what folks would say, um, Brian and Angela especially, what you'd say about um, you know, this debate. There's some debate about whether, you know, is it good to take up all your screen real estate um, you know, with a big image? Where has that been used successfully? Um, is maybe big, too big, too much? Um, how about this idea of having images that rotate on the page? You know, what if we had two, three, or four, or five images that kind of scroll through? Um, is that a good idea? Is that a way to compromise and say I can have more messages? Or is that not a good idea? Um, there, there's some debate and usability studies on both sides of that. Um, but I'd be curious to understand from, uh, you know, Angela or Brian, uh, what your senses on using big images on pages, where has that been used well in legal services communities? How can, how can legal services benefit from this trend? Um, I think that it works best when your website is um, uh, really wants to catch people's attention first and convey information um, as sort of secondary. So one of the websites that I work on is our, um, our website that's all about legal information for people representing themselves. And we don't have um, big images on there because it is more focused on, on just a lot of education and text. We have other websites in our program. For instance, we have a Welcoming Michigan campaign that's part of the broader Welcoming, the Nationwide Welcoming America campaign. And that, has a, that website has a different purpose to really attract attention and educate people. Um, and they use a lot more central images in that website. So I think it depends on what the purpose of, the main purpose of the website is. Right. The way, that, the way that I've seen ahead, it used buddy. effectively is if you have a particular uh, event, fundraising campaign, something else that you really want highlighted, um, if it's a more informational utilitarian site where there's many different things that people will come there for, I, I think it's less effective. Uh, but if you have an annual campaign or an upcoming uh, community outreach event you really want to focus on, then that can be a strong presentation style. Good point. So uh, one point is that it depends on the kind of content you're putting out and there's an overlap in what both of you said. And in particular, if, if you're trying to really focus on a particular campaign um, or message, this is, this is um, you know, a, a great way to do it. On the other hand, if you're more of a clearinghouse of a lot of different kinds of information, it could um, end up taking prominence away from, from other pieces. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I did mention that there's some discussion about whether this is a good idea from a usability point of view. Um, it turns out that in, in, in more cases, as more, as more folks are doing usability studies, the idea of a big central image for that sort of campaign style promotion does work in the sense that folks are clicking on them and moving to that message um, and, and then also taking action. So there's studies that are showing that. What, what studies are also showing is the folks that do slideshows uh, tend to assume that the slides, that as they slide by, that the second and third and fourth slide 
um, is also getting a lot of traffic because it's taking up substantial real estate on the home page. But it turns out uh, there's this rule that basically says you have about three seconds to five seconds to impress somebody um, on any given page. And by the time they've seen the second slide, three to five seconds may have already passed, and they're not clicking on it. So the slideshow concept is proven not to be so effective in terms of, you know, the first slide gets a lot of traffic, but the rest of them don't. Uh, something to think about there in terms of this trend. Uh, Angela, Brian, any other thoughts or comments on this? No. Great. Um, so that's a big trend, uh, something to consider for, for your websites. Um, another, another trend, um, is this trend of what's called an infographic, which is just a, a branding of, um, you know, a diagram. Um, an infographic is essentially a, a visual presentation of data. Um, they've come in a lot of forms. Uh, what you see here is uh, uh, different infographics. This one on the right is, is a pretty common one, the ACLU, where you have a very long page that has uh, messages and, you know, that lead to data. And the idea behind an infographic is to try to simplify some complex data using powerful visuals um, to prove a point, right? So it's meant to selectively choose data to prove a point, um, spread it down the page, um, get it presented visually so that you can understand um, what's going on. Something that might have lots of numbers becomes suddenly understandable. Um, you know, as someone more famous than me said, I'm not sure who, a, a novel is a tricky thing to map. Um, so when we're trying to tell stories on the web and we're trying to use sort of one infographic to tell a complex story, you need to be careful that, that uh, you're going to be forced to pick and choose how much information you can really show in order to prove a point and which pieces of the story are you leaving behind in order to simplify your message. It's true across all content, very much true of infographics, which tries to do both, stuff a lot of data into a screen, but also get some powerful visuals. Um, so with that said and that caveat, I'm wondering, uh, Angela and Brian, uh, what's your experience in the legal services community in, in using, a le uh, using infographics? Where have you seen this or where do you think this might be effective? Um, we've definitely noticed. noticed. Go for it. No, 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 you go ahead, Brian. And uh, we've definitely noticed that if we can take this type of information and use it for social media sharing specifically, it works much better than blocks of text. Anything that has this real visual appeal will get three to five times as many um, clicks, likes, shares as we would get from a similar amount of information in text. Great. Angela? What I was going to add is that I've seen this used uh, very effectively um, in fundraising. Illinois Legal Aid Online um, does a lot of infographics for their fundraising, and I think it's a great way to explain um, the, the benefit of our services quickly and easily to people who aren't familiar with them or aren't familiar with what we do or why it matters. So it's a great way to convey that quickly. Right, and I think that that makes a lot of sense. What's been um, What's been powerful about infographics are the ones that do go viral. Um, and uh, what, what Brian said is, is absolutely true. When you have a, a, a strong enough infographic and you spread it out through social media, you tend to get a lot of people spreading that more than other kinds of content. It's more compelling. Um, and so that can be a useful way to drive traffic. Um, they can be harder than you think to make. They're, um, they're escaping me at the moment, but there's utilities out there for making infographics kind of easy. There's certainly graphic design programs that are fairly easy to use. But when you start sitting down to do this kind of work, it can take a more thought than you can imagine to just to figure out what exactly am I going to present and then how am I going to depict it. Um, I, I was wondering, Brian, in your experience of having you know, done these and saw the traffic, um, did you find that to be true? Did you find utilities that actually made it quite easy to produce these? Um, how hard is it to uh, pull off one of these infographics? I mean, it's, it's definitely a skill having a staff member with either an artistic background or some specific training in this area is very helpful. Uh, we've found that getting students through University of Washington's information school has helped us create graphics like this. We did one related to uh, dashboards and what was possible while we were designing dashboards for our case management system. 
uh, but it, it is, they are not easy to create. You can't just tell somebody, hey, head to this site and punch in the information and it will create one automatically. There are some sites designed to do that, but the, the quality is not there unless you've got the skills. Right, that makes sense. And then, Angela, in your experience, are there any strategies or techniques you would recommend when you're trying to approach, you know, making your own infographic for uh, legal services? I have never made my own, so I have no idea. <laughs> it looks very <laughs> challenging. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would, I would say so. And in, in my, in my experience, it's good to, um, to to start at the end um, and, and say this this is sort of the truth that I want to convey um, in simple terms um, and and sort of build a graphic that shows that truth as clearly and concisely and compelling as possible. Um, that's on a napkin, some kind of black and white drawing. Um, and then from there figure out what data you have, um, you know, uh, because it's the truth, you know, supports that goal. If you start from the other direction where you have a whole bunch of data and you're wondering how to de depict it, what you tend to get are data heavy um, solutions. It's really hard to get a bunch of stuff and say, oh, I've got 48 things I really want to say. They all have numbers. And then to try to, you know, eliminate all that through the process of making infographic can be kind of torturous in meetings and decision making. So it's just something to think about. Um, infographics are very direction. Go ahead. I would probably follow Brian's direction and um, try to work with a student from the University of Michigan School of Information. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good good advice. Um, very good. So that's 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 the infographic trend uh, uh, that's proven useful. You know, in general, we, you know, images are more important, and, and sort of what we're seeing in uh, across the web and social media are more and more tools adopting images as sort of a standard to communicate. I mean, you've got your uh, Pinterest here, you've got Instagram, you've got Twitter with Twitter pics, you've got Facebook where um, uh, many, many, many more posts than in the early days are, are image posts or video-based posts. Um, and you see that you've got a variety of kinds of images uh, that are, are being used, images that are more infographic-y, so lots of information on them. Images that are sort of, you know, simple quotes or statements. Um, you'll often have a, maybe an image of a, a political figure or some kind of visceral image with a quote on it. Um, there's also the sort of standard where you have a story and an action to, to tell and, and a visceral, you know, sort of image on top. Um, one of the things we're finding um, more and more is that, um, you know, some, some groups are stumbling on, on choosing images that are uh, not necessarily culturally sensitive to the communities. Um, so we need to be a little bit careful that our images do make it really easy to quickly convey a point, but depending on who you're talking to, they may take it away that you don't expect. This image on the right is a good example of that. Um, to some cultures and communities, depending on who you're working with in legal services, um, this could be seen as poverty porn. Um, it could also be seen as a very compelling thing, that I, you know, situation that I want to help out. Um, so we run into this all the time. I'm curious in your experiences, uh, Angela and Brian, um, how have, you know, sort of images in general been used effectively in legal services? Have you run into situations where um, images, you know, had a, had a very strong positive effect or perhaps a negative effect? Um, with, with regard to outreach events, we've definitely uh, seen that the flyers that we put together that um, target a community and are developed by a, a community partner um, who is familiar with what will work in that particular community are significantly better. Um, so for example, when we were doing outreach uh, to the local Chinese community, we partnered with um, another nonprofit that helped that community specifically to design the uh, flyer that we then shared on Facebook, put up on our website, and the turnout for that was standing room only. Um, but we did not have the expertise in-house to know what type of graphics would work, would have worked best for that community. Right, right, that's a good example. Angela, what are your thoughts? Um, again, we don't, I, 
You know, I personally don't have a lot of experience using images. Um, I know that we need to use them more in our outreach. Um, I think because we are still a relatively new program, I just we just don't have much experience. But I, I like what Brian has to say about um, seeking out experts within the community that you're trying to reach. Right. I I think it's a it's a good point. Um, it, it's nice to. Um, also, if you're worried about that issue, um, it, it, and we all should be ultimately, we all should be uh, trying hard to really understand who we're working with, and that goes true for like building new websites or having a new campaign that's going to involve images. It's nice to get a selection of those folks, just a few, to um, you know look at some models of what you're trying to do, and if, if you're trying to choose some pretty compelling images for a campaign or something, you know just. Just check it out and see if what you're choosing, you know, is resonating. If it falls flat, if it's actually negative, um, it, it's a nice thing to do. You can go to places like, you know, there's stock photo sites to get images. Um, those can be challenging because they have lots of uh, flat, boring images that everyone's seen. Um, but if you kind of hunt around in them, uh, you can find ones that are more unusual or, or more more towards your mission and your goals. Um, and they have a big plus of if you don't have very good images and are hard to come by or you're trying to hire photographers, you can get images. So like iStock Photo and Morgue File and um, because one, one that's kind of neat called deathtostockphoto.com. Um, but there's just tons of them out there that will offer free or inexpensive um, photos that you can choose from and, and uh, you know, uh, fill, out, fill out your sites um, and make sure that you have something compelling. You know, with, with, with all photo choices of all kinds of graphics, uh, it's really important to center in on, on the story um, you're trying to tell. Um, it's, you know, you, what, what we're finding more and more is that there's more images being used on the web uh, overall. Um, there tends to be more of a, because, because there's a great variety now of images being used m mixed with uh, text and mixed with storytelling, what we're finding is that there's a lot of mismatches. You'll find images that um, are being used because someone thought it looked great, and that probably does, but the story context is odd uh, next to it, and in some cases where it really meshes well. Um, so, you know, think about the story you're trying to tell. So building a well is the easy part. Um, you know, when you look at the photo, are you, are you getting the sense that we're, you know, positively making change? Is that what you're trying to convey? Are you getting the sense that there's a disaster and we need your help? Um, you know, think about what you're trying to convey and how you're getting it across. Um, I'm w wondering if there's uh, any thoughts, uh, Brian, um, from, from your side about, you know, using images uh, in terms of matching that to the story. Um, do you have any uh, examples of, of maybe legal services sites um, where this has been done effectively to share? I mean, this is really a new, a new trend. We're starting to um, try to come up with very visual icons that will appeal across cultures. We're uh, trying to come up with some images, but traditionally we've been a very text heavy uh, group of websites. So there are a lot of examples where there's very few images so far. Right. Right. And uh, Angela, and, and as a, I think you mentioned as a sort of a, a newer program, um, you, uh, how have you guys started to approach, you know, define, the, figuring out what story you're going to tell and then how you might sort of imagine those or, or depict those and um, using images? Have you started that process yet? Has that been something that's taken a lot of time or, or thinking? Uh, where are you at with that? Well, I mean, on some level, um, when we designed the website, we, we selected a class of icons to sort of use throughout the website, which are, I mean, they're not really images, but um, we use those and we use that throughout all of our marketing materials. But as, um, as Brian said, it's, we're very information heavy. Um, the real images that we use are through our videos. Um, and one way that we've, you know, when we've done our videos, we've gone with all animation style videos. And so we've kind of not had to deal with the, the issues around selecting good images because we've, you know, made our own that are very um, not real. <laughs> so right. um, 
as we move forward with our PR and our marketing, you know, our marketing materials, we definitely need images, um, and we, we haven't really begun that process yet. Right. And now, there's a great a question here in the comments. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, which is asking about um, the accessibility of the images for individuals with screen readers. And this is definitely something that people want to approach at the beginning of their design process. Um, when you add images, it's important to have alternative text uh, that explains or lets an individual with a screen reader know what the image is trying to convey. Uh, a common mistake is to take something like what we see on the screen where there is important text on there and not have that uh, in the alternative text. Most content management systems will make it very easy so you no longer need a programmer to add that alternative text. The WYSIWYG, the what you see is what you get editor, has an option there to put that text in. But that's very important to do. Yeah, and, and, and that's a good point. So, you know, folks with a, a visual and uh, cognitive and other kinds of disabilities that are visiting that website will often use a you know, screen reader, which is just a utility that, that will read the screen in some way for them. Um, and, and because it's reading the screen, it's relying on the text and definitions that you put into your web pages to help that be read intelligently. And so having these alternative tags behind your images allow the screen reader to read something smart about the image. Um, and too many sites have ignored that piece. So there's a nice image that's supposed to convey a message and it literally says nothing to the screen reader. Um, so that's really important. And then to Angela's point, what we haven't seen in these slides is this idea of on, on an information heavy website that you might be using more iconic representations, um, you know, icons that have symbols or that sort of thing to sort of set aside, uh, especially in content heavy sites. So content heavy sites typically have categories of content, collections of content, and you might have to wade through, you know, some or several pages to, to understand that content. And so it's having sort of common icons or colors or that sort of thing um, can help the user understand um, where they're at, what they're talk, what they're seeing, um, uh, to to get the point across. Um, great question. Okay, good. So that that covers a lot of um, a lot of ground around sort of image use and trends around images on the website. Um, wanted to move to kind of more of the technical side and specifically looking at um, some things uh, mobile and some other uh, technical challenges. Let's Let's take a look at uh, uh, mobile. Um, mobile meaning uh, it's becoming increasingly critical, and that's because many, many, many more people, um, the, the percentage is growing dramatically year over, year over year, are accessing sites primarily through their mobile device. So that doesn't mean they're sometimes accessing it, but they're most often accessing it, websites through their mobile device. And mobile devices, as you see here, there's uh, two of them on the screen, but there's actually many sizes. There's iPads, there's iPad minis, there's phones that are big and small, and there's phones that can go landscape, you mean flip them to the side, stand them up and down. So as you can see, the screens can be in all kinds of sizes. Um, so websites, it used to be that you could, uh, in order to effectively put a website on a mobile device, you, you pretty much had to build an application that was specific to that, that device. So you'd have to build a website and build an application. Um, that's sort of quickly fallen aside um, for many, many applications, general applications, where we have a website, we would just like it to look good on mobile devices. So you can build websites that are mobile ready, um, meaning that their screens essentially change size appropriately to fit other screen sizes. So big screens, small screens, medium screens, whatever they are, it intelligently changes the screen so that um, content is stacked nicely and can be read. Um, appropriately. Um, what, what's your experience, Brian and Angela, with you know, working with mobile sites, some of the challenges, um, uh, techniques you may have used, um, sites you've seen that do this well? This is one way in which we were lucky to be a relatively new site because when we built our site in <clears throat> 2012, we built it on a mobile-ready platform. Um, and we still had a lot of work to do cleaning up the CSS to make it um, look really pretty and work perfectly. But, um, you know, we launched the website, we launched Michigan Legal Help in 2012, and we realized pretty early on that about 30% of our users were accessing it um, by mobile. 
And I looked at our stats this morning, and we're actually up to 53% of our users um, view it on a tablet or a mobile phone. So we've crossed over the 50% mark. Um, we, you know, we did use the mobile ready um, Drupal theme, but we, like I said, we still had a lot of work to do, um, reordering, you know, figuring out how to how to fit the menus in and make those look nice. Um, we have a um, full screen county select box on our on our big site that doesn't work at all on the mobile site, so we had to make that a um, a drop down menu. Um, listing the counties alphabetically. Um, there were a lot of other, um, like I said, CSS things that we had to do, but in the end, we, we, it didn't take that much work. We, um, it was a summer project for one of our School of Information interns, and he did it mostly on his own with help from our staff. So it was, um, it was cost effective to do and um, really had huge impact. I think that's partly why our number, our mobile numbers did go up so um, high. It went from about 30% in 2013 to 53% today. Great. One of the big uh, reasons that we ended up moving our video content from a proprietary player on LSMTAP to YouTube was mobile accessibility. About 30 to 40% of our users access our videos via either a tablet or a smartphone and YouTube just does everything to reshape, resize, and present that to where it will work on any platform, something that we just didn't have the technical expertise to do in-house. So they're much easier to find there and they're mobile accessible. That's great. And the the, the trend is continuing that these, what we, we've mentioned on a few slides, content management systems, these are systems that help you um, easily um, build websites um, and maintain websites um, without having to know sort of technical HTML so much. Um, these content management systems, one was mentioned Drupal, there's WordPress, there's a variety of others, um, are, are building more and more sort of mobile-ready themes, meaning uh, themes that you can uh, um, looks of websites that you can sort of choose and replace out your images and your own colors, and they're built so that they can react to different screen sizes. As as Angela said, uh, it's not quite as easy as that. There's um, it, that gets you a long way, but you you still, as you start looking at it, mobile devices start to wonder and want to you know move things around a slightly differently or maybe substantially differently than the theme has it set up. So um, those. You know, getting your site mobile ready in some way so that it at least isn't broken in mobile devices can be a fairly easy thing to do with modern content management systems. Getting it to look the way you want it to on different mobile devices can take a lot more um, sort of coding um, and decision making. Um, which devices are you targeting? What are you trying to? Um, what are you trying to do? But as we've seen already in this conversation, you know, sites are getting more than 50% in some cases uh, mobile traffic. Um, that trend line is going to continue to go up. Um, so you definitely want to be there and be on mobile. Um, good. Let's take a look at a, another trend happening. Um, microsites. Um, this is a sort of a fancy name for uh, having another website besides your main website. Um, really, a microsite uh, is this trend where uh, an organization may have some specific uh, resource um, or campaign. And they'd really like to target people to that resource or campaign, um, have control of branding to really showcase what it's about, um, separate it from the main site, maybe um, quite often to keep it from being so organizational or so buried, and to have really a singular focus on what's going on. Um, so, you know, uh, Covenant House here has abolished child trafficking, um, and uh, there's, there, there's this uh, legal defense fund has has this focus here. And, and the idea is, is that um, by building these microsites, maybe um, we can drive more and more traffic to our particular cause because of the time and attention we put into branding it, to marketing it, the, the very focused message. Um, on the other hand, it's um, another site in some way. Um, or even if it's not another site, it's some kind of more complicated area of your existing site that has a fully different look and feel. Um, in either case, it takes some time and effort to, to 
to uh, think through what the microsite would be, what the pages are, what exactly the pictures, the action is going to be. You know, again, it's another smaller site. Um, Angela and Brian, in your experience, have you seen or used microsites in your experience? That, um, and if you have, um, have you seen them be successful? Do you find them too much work? Um, where, where does this work well or poorly for you? So at, at Northwest Justice Project, we're experimenting with it for our uh, veterans project specifically. We're highlighting some of the things that we have that are most used by veterans from our larger Washington Law Help site on this subsite. We currently have several lawyers dedicated to the veterans project, and we've got the ability to maintain, update that. It, it really does bring up some concerns over staffing, updating, making sure that these are currently um, supported sites. We've had other parts of our program ask for them but didn't have the resources to really maintain it. Uh, it does definitely work for a targeted audience where you've got the resources to keep it up to date and alive. That makes sense. Uh, Angela, what's your um have you done uh, any work on, on the, the site that you've built around microsites or any thinking around that? Or are there any examples that pop up that um, are good or bad models? Uh, we have not done any for Michigan Legal Help. But um, another program in our office, um, we have a, I'm affiliated with the Michigan Immigrant Rights Center. And they created a separate website solely dedicated to this Welcoming Michigan project. Um, which is part of the nationwide Welcoming America that I, I mentioned earlier. And they decided to, um, to break that out into its own separate site, and it's separately mm -hmm. branded. Um, it's not, you wouldn't necessarily know that it's affiliated with Merck. Um, so it's, you know, and, and we had concern about um, the resources for that, and I don't think it gets a lot of updating and um, I think it does suffer for lack of attention um, because it is just a subset of what the Immigrant Rights Center does. So right. I think it definitely, um, you have to really think about whether it's worth making a completely separate website. Right, and I, I think that's, that's, a, that's good caution. and, and uh, Caroline asks as well in, in the chat, um, I wonder if it isn't more confusing because so many of our people have multiple issues. Um, they come with one issue, but in fact have many, and therefore might be better off keeping um, away from a microsite, integrating into a larger website. Um, this is exactly uh, the challenge. Um, if you have a lot of issues, um, and you know they have kind of relatively equal weight, you know it, it becomes difficult to imagine. Really, am I going to build like five or six or seven or ten microsites? Um, you know, that, that becomes quite a big burden. If you have budget and staffing, that might be really valuable. Um, uh, but these are separate sites. Um, they become tougher to integrate and manage. And, and their lifespan, especially when campaigns sort of end, what you do with all that traffic and how you reroute them back to your site. And, you know, there's just lots of decisions to make there. Um, you know, on the other hand, uh, some nonprofits um, and, and services communities have used uh, microsites well, especially if the if the campaign is singular and kind of big, it's the biggest thing going on, and it's going to last a while. It's not a month, but you know, if it's a substantial, maybe it's an annual campaign where you're really driving to some goal for that particular year. Um, a microsite might be a good investment because everyone everywhere can kind of push on that on that site and kind of get people a little bit away from the organizational um, sort of structure of the main site. Um, toss it around. There's pros and cons there. Um, yeah, Eric makes a really good point that the time frame of which the site is going to be up matters. As you put up a new site, it's going to take a while before Google is able to notice it. And if you don't have enough links from the rest of the community, that microsite may get ignored where your main site is already well established and has the search engine optimization and uh, page rank to be seen. Well, one other. That's, 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 um, that's good information, and, and, one, and that made me think of one other way that folks have sort of 
quasi pulled off microsites that may be interesting is um, if, if you're using a content management system such as Drupal or WordPress, uh, you know, there's Plone, Joomla, there's a whole variety of them. Um, they, they allow you, again, to have a, a, a theme that you've built. It's, it's a look and feel, a structure to your website. So they, you know, you know, make sure that their header and a footer are the same across all your pages. Well, that theme can be altered somewhat so that certain pages, you know, like in Drupal, for instance, certain page types might have a different theme. Um, so that theme might have a different great big graphic at the top or something. And that's not a microsite per se, but it's a way to have some pages have a you know, substantially different look without doing too much um, work that a microsite might cause. You know, it's still one site you're working with. Um, yes, you're doing some modifications to the theme, but all the pages are still centrally managed. So if you're using one of those systems or planning on it and do want to have kind of a unique display for some kind of a campaign, you might consider that as a stopgap. Um, okay, so that's, that's a lot about microsites. can really uh, push forward a message as long as it's something you can invest in and, and is, is something your organization is really sort of hammering on as a priority. I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, another trend that's happening uh, is there, there's more there's more and more use of page motion. I, you know, I would actually argue that for years and years and years, motion on a page, on a website, so when you've loaded a page, having things move um, without you moving them um, has been going on for years, quite some time. Um, there's been more fluidity happening with some of the new technologies. So what's happening is, is sort of two things essentially. When, when you load a screen, um, maybe uh, you know, content marketing for nonprofits sort of pulls up and reveals the 86% figure below, you know, as you're staring at the screen, which is a way to sort of, um, you know, visually communicate that, you know, we do content marketing for nonprofits, here's why, um, by moving the screen up and down and showing and hiding sort of a message. Um, another thing that's happening are what, what are called these single page scroll websites, which is um, a, a sort of a, a page that's mostly design, designed for a mobile uh, viewing. As you might know, if you have a, you know, an iPad, you're using your fingers and you're kind of swiping the screen up and down to move it you know, through all the content. So these single page websites are actually quite long pages, but as you swipe your fingers up and down, it sort of flips from section to section. It kind of looks like you're moving between pages. Um, what those single page scroll websites are also doing is as you're scrolling up and down, things can change on the screen. This happens with um, some pretty fancy groups like uh, oh, NASA and the Space Shuttle site or Tesla, the, the big electric car company. Um, they've done some pretty fancy stuff which as a page moves, you know, parts to the shuttle come together or fly apart or have explanations about what they do. Um, and so the, the idea that people are trying to do with page motion is to say, you know, get your eye to focus on something moving and then provide a message. Now, what's also been happening for years is still happening now, which is that there's a lot of people putting page motion on a website that just basically is distracting. I think people thought it was cool, but really what it has done is taken the eye away from the message to look at the pretty thing moving. Um, so we want to be very careful that when we're doing page motion that we're not you know, breaking the experience of people coming to the site, that we're not sort of having them look at the motion and, and not look at the message. It needs to be an enhancement to what you're trying to convey and not the star itself. Um, you know, with that said, I'm wondering, uh, uh, Angela and Brian, have either of you uh, seen or used this uh, or, or considered using these techniques um, in your work? I have not. Yeah, I, I haven't either. Our, um, we've definitely had people who have been uh, very scared of using any type of motion or action as part of the design process. Um, I would like to give it a try, but it is definitely not something we've done traditionally. Right. You know, I, I think the most approachable way to think about or, or to consider using um, uh, motion is not so much pages that that as you're staring at them move for you. I mean, people are doing this with the, with the, um, the most common thing is to have that slideshow that kind of scrolls, you know, from right to left. Um, but, you know, there's other kinds of things where windows can fade in and fade out. Um, that can be more annoying to users because they kind of have to wait for that to happen before they can do something. Um, 
the nicer thing is to start looking at these single page scroll websites because what those are really doing is, is building a website mostly for a mobile audience, but they also work well on, on a big screen um, because you can still use your mouse on a big screen to kind of pull the scroll bar down um, or just click links on the page that move you down the page. And, and basically it's revealing another page. Maybe it looks different. Uh, but it's really just pulling it up. It's like scrolling through the pages. And then it, 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 it's a design strategy that can look very well on big screens as well as mobile, and it also doesn't change shape much. So one of the things that happens a lot with mobile design is that you build a site for a bigger screen, and you have like a menu bar on the right. You have different columns going on. And then when it gets to the mobile, you end up having to flip those columns. So instead of having them side to side, you have them all stack on top of each other. Uh, and, and that starts to have a whole different experience for people on mobile. And the, and the idea of the single page scroll is that you don't change it much. No matter if it's on a big screen or a tiny screen, uh, as you move fluidly through, it looks the same pretty much for everybody on every device. So I think that's a more approachable way to look at it. Um, so page motion is possible. It's trendy. Make sure that it's not the star of the show, but it's enhancing your message if you're going to deploy on um, page motion. Uh, another kind of uh, uh, technique that's becoming more and more popular is, is this thing called uh, popovers. Um, you know, on a on a critical note, we might call these roadblocks. Um, what these do is when you get to a website, um, it may ask you for important information to use the website. So, for instance. Um, confirm your local station uh, is this idea that if you confirm your local station and you go to this, this sort of radio site, um, we can make sure we present you with information that's going to be relevant to you because you're much, much more likely to be looking for your local station. Um, another kind of popover is, is more um, roadblocky in the sense that it's saying, um, you know, sign up to receive critical updates. It's basically saying, well, before you get to this page, we'd like to invite you um, to be friendly about it, to sign up. Um, and then once you do that, you can go to the page or click the X if you don't like it. Um, so I use the word roadblock because it's blocking the user from getting to the page. They're expecting to get to a web page. They, they weren't told that, oh, when you click this link, there's going to be an ask for an email address. Like that's not what they were told. They were told we're going to get to a website that, that I think I want to go to. I click the link and a pop-up appears instead of the website. So you have to keep that in mind that a roadblock can be really effective for gathering information because it's right in front. It's the first thing they see when they get to a certain page. But it can also have a negative experience in the sense that people aren't getting to what they want. They might leave the site. Um, they might otherwise just think that uh, the, the site isn't as valuable as they were hoping. Um, so, so those are some drawbacks. Um, Brian or Angela, do you, do you use these in, in, in your work or have you seen these used um, out there in the legal services community? We don't use them right now. Um, when we um, started our live help, which is a chat-based function, a lot of statewide websites have it, um, that we can you know, chat with users and help them navigate the website or answer questions that don't require legal advice. Um, when we started that process, um, we you know, live engage asked us if we wanted the pop-ups. You know, anytime people look at a piece of content to have a pop-up come on and say, you know, hey, would you like to chat with us? And we decided not to because um, I didn't want to assume that people couldn't use the website or needed help. Um, and we were afraid that it would block important information. You know, like they go to the website to read the information because they have a legal problem that they need to learn about. Um, so we decided not to use those in any way. But um, we were hoping to start a statewide triage program um, that would help uh, you know, uh, link sort of direct people to resources um, that they would sort of be separate from just browsing the website. And so we're, we're going to be thinking about how we might want to use something um, like this to let people know that there's another option besides just browsing the website that they can be directed to specific resources. Right. That, that, seems, like a, that seems like a wise strategy um, to, to go forward. Brian, have you seen these used in, in, in your work uh, effectively or ineffectively? I mean, the, the technical support or the chat option, 
um, is something that we used to use on LS MTAP. Um, it definitely uh, would get people to uh, interact with us, although it, it wasn't always uh, individuals who had who understood the site that they were even on. Um, there, it was a lot more time to monitor uh, than the results that we got out of it. Um, we try to avoid anything that uh, forces people to give us personal information before getting to legal information on our websites so that they can be there as close to anonymously with as little clicks as possible. In the privacy policies and stuff that we've suggested for some legal aid organizations, we've even added sections in how they can turn off cookies or other tracking mechanism if they don't want that there. Um, so that type of data collection is something that we've kind of moved away from unless it's very voluntary where they're opting in and it's something that they would be going after. Yeah, and 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 I think that's that's good information. And and then sort of going along with that in the in in, in the chat, um, Ket says, you know, the better use of popovers I've seen is when they pop up when you hit the end of an article. And this is this this is true. There's a sense of um, you know maybe we want to put something in front of people's eyes, but we also want to make sure that we're really getting our message pop across and we're not you know annoying them. Um, we, you know, to, to your point, Brian, there's certain kinds of things that we're asking for, um, such as, you know, maybe you can contact us or make a call or something, but then that requires monitoring that, that um, because, of course, if you ask people to do that and then you don't answer them, um, you know, that can be a problem. You know, some other ways to think about doing something like popovers where you're saying, hey, I just really want to make sure this option's in front of people, um, but I might not necessarily want to roadblock them. Um, there's there's a CSS code, and this is often deployed on, a, again, content management system websites where you can have certain elements of the page uh, are basically sitting on a layer. So you might have your regular web page, but there might be this additional layer that all it really has is a little block, a little square area on the right or left of the screen. Maybe it has Facebook and Twitter icons in it. Maybe it has sign up for our email newsletter. But it's this little block that as a person scrolls up and down the page, the block kind of stays on the page. It doesn't scroll away. It floats with the page. Um, that, that's just a, a sort of a coding trick, not very hard to do, and can make some elements of your page, um, as long as they're not as they're subtle, they don't take over a large amount of the page, kind of stay there no matter where the person's going. Um, they never lose sight of, um, you know, that they can sign up or so forth. But it doesn't prevent them from reading the, the page itself. Right. There, there's a, a startup um, out of the information school here at University of Washington that uh, tries to embed a common, like frequently asked questions related to the page that an individual is on uh, to try to cut down on the number of questions that they get asked. I think that that type of technology could be deployed efficiently when you look at related legal problems. If someone is on a uh, dissolution or divorce area of the website, and then there's uh, parenting plans or other related things that could be displayed in that sidebar. I think it could be very effective. I just haven't seen it done yet. Right. Uh, right. So just just beware. Um, um, popovers. You can collect a lot of information because you're putting it right in front of folks' eyes, but there's uh, some uh, blowback potentially in the uh, in not giving people what they were originally asking for. Um, so think about that. Uh, another uh, big trend is uh, social sign-on. This is this uh, concept that if you have, um, let's say you have a blog uh, or you have just um, articles on your website that allow people to comment, um, you may be asking people to submit their information. Um, in order to do that, they may need to log in um, so that you know, they're a user on your site and therefore have the um, permission to post some, some messages. This is quite common. Uh, news sites, blog sites, um, all do this. Um, they, they, they most typically, you know, want you to log in so we know who it is, you know, in some way that's that's communicating. Well, um, the the old method, sort of before social media really really took off, um, was that a lot of websites that had blogs and articles and these kinds of login systems just had their own separate login. So you might have a website, you have your own way for folks to log in. Those folks have to have an account on your site in order to access the services. And the new trend is to use what's called social sign-on, which is instead folks would use their 
their existing sign-on they're already using for Twitter, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever the social media tool is, and they use that to log into your site. It has a lot of, um, a lot of benefits. Um, some, some of the benefits are, you know, the person, especially in these very, very popular tools like Facebook, um, it, it's quite, quite commonly the case that the person, you know, immediately knows their login and password because that's just something they committed to memory because they're using it all the time. They're also very likely already logged in to Facebook in some browser window, and they're visiting your site, and they want to comment, and you say, oh, you can sign on with Facebook, and by just clicking a button, they're logged in, right, because the browser already kind of knows they're logged in over at Facebook, so they can log in on your site. Um, if not, they can still log in with their Facebook account. Again, that's nice because they don't have to create another one with your site. They can use one they already know. It gives you a lot of information because once you know um, folks' uh, uh, usernames on Facebook, there's a you know, wealth of information that's provided via um, Facebook to, um, to, to, to folks about you know, who this person is on some level. Um, so that's stuff that you can start you know, mining and understanding who, in fact, is participating on your site. Um, it, it's, it's also a way to, to sort of outsource your user management. Um, you, you know, the, 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 all the work that goes into sort of who these people are and whether or not they're, um, um, you know, machines that are just sort of making up logins and going to post a bunch of Viagra spam and so forth, a lot of that's being sort of handled through the, the Facebook sort of tools of, you know, becoming a user of Facebook and so forth. And so you're more likely to have real, you know, people actually commenting. I'm not saying that they're going to make nice comments. You still have to monitor what people are doing on your site. But it, it makes uh, that job a bit easier um, uh, for your sites. Now, the drawback is, of course, that a lot of people don't necessarily want to share, um, you know, what's going on in their Facebook world with stuff they're doing elsewhere, right? And so this, if, if that's the only option, and this happens to us a lot um, in my own work where, um, sites will have the, the only option is a Facebook login, and you know a lot of us will be unwilling to to use that because we're not interested to share information. We're not quite sure what we're going to share with that site. Um, so there can be some privacy concerns with that as well. Um, so while there's a lot of these benefits that are easier to the user and easier and gives you a lot of information and less management, there can be some some drawbacks too in terms of people's privacy concerns. Um, Angela and Brian, um, a social sign on something that you're using or, or have seen used, um, what do you think of this sort of trade-off between ease of use and uh, privacy? So almost no one in the legal services area is using these because of the privacy concerns. Um, I also blog in the gaming community and they're extremely popular there. They're great if people are voluntarily putting out their information that they want connected with those companies, but I understand why legal services has kind of avoided them entirely. It's the privacy concerns that you brought up. Right. And uh, Angela, are you using social sign-in at all on the site that, that you guys built? No, we're not. Um, we don't really take in any information on our on our legal help website. It's all sort of outgoing. Um, there's no way for anyone to leave comments or um, engage with us in that way. And um, as Brian said, it's sort of been the way that things have always been done. I'm very interested to see um, Illinois Legal Aid Online is doing a huge redevelopment of their site, and they are going to allow for commenting and this type of interaction. So. Um, I think in a couple years, um, in a year or two probably, we'll be able to see what their experience is. When they, when they mentioned this at the TIG conference, they got a lot of um, people thinking that they were crazy for allowing the public to comment on their website and, and take feedback that way. So right. it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. No, I, I'm excited to see how that project goes. I think there could be a lot of very valuable information that comes about from that process. You know, a, a, a lot of, when it comes to legal services, so I, if we're it, and it's thinking about three examples, actually, uh, two nonprofits that provide, actually three nonprofits that provide legal services and one that provides actually sales. And, and, and in all three cases, they, they, they have um, uh, login opportunities 
um, but they're not meant for um, sharing sort of services information. They're much more meant for uh, rudimentary tasks such as like uh, completing a transaction like a sales transaction or getting some material. Um, and, and, and what these sites have done instead is to say, well, we do want to capitalize on the social networks. Like we want to bring people in who are on these networks. Um, and so what all three of these sites have done is, and, and focused on LinkedIn is just start some LinkedIn you know, professional groups right on the LinkedIn site and just have conversations on LinkedIn with professionals um, uh, in that environment entirely. So everyone's accustomed to what LinkedIn is. Nobody's trying to have sort of privacy issues violated. Um, you're more so trying to gather a folk of like-minded group of like-minded people to talk more and to be more exposed to your website. So as opposed to just sort of pu pushing messages into your LinkedIn account or into your Facebook account, actually managing a conversation and a network of people um, there and sort of you know, skipping the social sign-on piece altogether, but getting some of those benefits of just pulling those two communities closer. Um, so uh, just looking at the chat, um, one person mentions uh, it's better to do CAPTCHA to slow down robots or moderate posts and to require logins. Um, it, this, uh, th this is the sort of the big problem with having community websites or you know, websites where you're managing conversations is you know, how do you make sure that the people that are coming in are, are in fact people and, and, and if they are people that they're people that are going to contribute well. So uh, a couple ways that was mentioned by Caroline here, um, CAPTCHAs are ways where when folks log into a, um, a website, before they hit submit, they have to fill out some, you know, figure out a math problem or, or type in some characters that are displayed in kind of a fuzzy image. Um, and that's a way to try to um, thwart robots uh, and other code that's been written to try to get into your site. Not perfect, but um, they're, they're working better and better, um, but people are always fighting them as well. And then definitely in any kind of community, you have to moderate it because there's always going to be people that, you know, feel anonymous or don't violate the rules and make the conversation go from good to bad. And, and you want to, you know, weed those folks out and, and keep, keep a, you know, strong command of what's going on in the community. Um, so, you know, both moderation of the con as well as sort of making sure people coming in the gate are, are filtered in some way are both strong tools to use. Um, great. A any more thoughts, uh, Angela, Brian, on, on this topic? Nope. All right. Nope. Let's move into uh, content for our last, uh, last area here. Um, so content is king, uh, meaning that uh, websites, you know, sort of live and die on what kind of content you put out. Um, it's it's uh, important to really make sure that we're focused sort of first and foremost on what's our message in terms of text um, as well as the images and videos. Um, you know, the first principle is to have friendly human language. Um, a, a, like a site like this, there's this entire screen and there's about 50 words on the screen. Um, a couple big powerful visuals, one in the background and three icons really. Um, and then there's a little shopping cart at the top. Um, and, and this is just, an example of, of a site that's trying to get a message across and it has, has taken whatever acronyms and buzzwords and internal speak you might have. Um, legal services certainly has a lot of that, but every, every um, uh, area, sort of sector of nonprofits um, has their, their sort of internal language. And you want to make sure that we're really communicating to that audience. And for most of us, that's some kind of an external audience that isn't working at our organizations, may not be very familiar at all. Um, we need to communicate to them, and so that's this friendly and human language approach. Um, I I'm wondering, Angela, as you built your website, um, was that all a struggle in terms of writing your own content to think, st start, you know, stop thinking, you know, inward and sort of as an organization and think more about the, the friendly language approach? How did you guys deal with that? It was. We spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time thinking about it. Um, <clears throat> our content developers did a language course that was offered through Transcend, um, through a TIG grant, TIG with um, uh, Legal Aid uh, of the New York. So I think it was Western New York. Um, and that was really helpful. We, um, especially when conveying, you know, difficult con legal concepts and um, 
you know, things that are just really scary to people, such as going to court or getting divorced or being evicted. I um, wanted to be very careful with our language, um, both that it was plain and also that it was um, easy to understand and sort of welcoming language. And I, it, it took us a long time. I mean, all of my content developers are lawyers, and we're used to the other lawyers um, writing for other lawyers and other and it, it is very much um, an process. Um, I hear that in law schools they're trying to teach plain language more, so there's hope for the future. But really uh, taking the time to do an, an in-depth training um, and paying attention to this at every moment of every day I think is really key. When we do our content, we have um, three levels of plain language review. We always, we always try to have someone else do the plan, you know, someone besides the author does the plan language reviews. Um, and we also work with non lawyers in our office. They um, help us a lot with the plan language review because their input, you know, they tell us when things don't make sense or sound right. So those are some right. of the things that we've done. Yeah, and that's that's actually what, what you've described is very um, typical. It can seem like, oh my gosh, that's a large project, but, you know, it can be really hard to. Friendly, you know, make language become friendly and very approachable. Um, Brian, what are your thoughts on on this? How, how have you guys proceeded with this problem? And we strongly agree that plain language is extremely important. Transcend has done some great work there. Uh, we just went through the process of uh, working with the court to redo the family law forms in Washington State, but it is so important that you get non-lawyers to give you feedback and not just uh, screeners or somebody who deals with legal jargon on a daily basis, uh, users that know nothing about the law, because they will sh point out pieces of text that seem intuitive to you that make no sense to them. The user testing is essential. Yeah, th those are those are great points. Um, so so just just remember this this may seem obvious. We do want to have friendly human language. Just remember that it can take a lot of time. Um, so. So think hard about that. Um, when when we build websites with with folks, um, uh, you know, most recently helping uh, folks at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, you know, we're constantly challenging our clients to say, well, um, this is a great idea to write this stuff, but you know, are you really going to write it? Let's have an example of it. Let's see how long it really takes you to do it, so that we can understand is it achievable, um, just in terms of your time and staffing, to get what you really want. And then if it is, how much can you do sort of on a weekly and monthly basis so that, um, you know, it, it's something that you can always write friendly human language um, and, and not sort of drop the ball sort of after the site is launched. Um, uh, I also wanted to point out that there's a good conversation in the um, uh, chat over requiring login and allowing people, or not requiring, having optional login that then allows people to customize their view. If you have someone who's returning to your website and looking at specific resources and wants to collect those together, uh, that could be a very useful way to cut down their transactional cost so that they can get to the things that they need on a reoccurring basis. That, that's great information. Uh, Angela, do you have another thought? Um, I just wanted to say one more thing about the friendly language is that it's a job that's never done. We review all of our content once a year, and plain language review is a review that we do every single year. And I just challenge my staff that you can always improve on this. And we, we use the tools to evaluate the grade level and the plain language, and you can just always, you can al almost always continue to improve your language. Uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, it really is never done. So this is work you'll be doing for a long time. So let's make it sustainable. <laughs> um, Good. Uh, there's this concept uh, uh, sort of trendy uh, these days as well, up and coming, if you will. I mean, it's been done for a long, long time since websites have begun, but content marketing is, is, is sort of a, a big thing. And this, you know, it's in quotes because it's a little strange to talk about content market, marketing in the nonprofit community generally because it, most of us are putting out content to market it. You know, now when we're talking about for-profit firms, uh, it, it, it tends to be that there's these 
message channels that they're trying to really push out. And so they'll write a content piece and then you know, uh, spend lots of time getting it into um, other worlds and getting it um, seen um, in very specific and strategic ways. Um, you know, nonprofits can do this too. And basically the idea being that there's, there's some sort of focused content that we'd like to um, get folks you know, engaged with. Um, and push it out into other networks such as you know, maybe get, get some cross-posting of that on LinkedIn, you know, possibly running um, a Google ad campaign, which by the way, Google gives free sort of ads to 501c3 nonprofits, and one can use those ads to promote certain content and get that to go you know, market higher and viral, um, you know, pay for placements in various places. Um, but content marketing is a, a strategy to push certain kinds of content um, you know, into um, other worlds. Um, the other kinds of tools you can use are techniques around search engine optimization, which just makes sure um, it's not so much that you're marketing to a particular community, more so you're making sure that you're more findable in search engines by building a site that has um, your, your headings um, are properly coded, that you're using keywords and phrases and visible text on your site, and there's a variety of uh, techniques you can use when you're building a site to, uh, to make sure that your content can be found um, and thus is more marketed. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Brian or Angela, are there any specific marketing strategies, techniques, tools, um, or maybe worlds that you've approached with content to ca help push out messages uh, in either of your work? I think the most important thing that I've definitely found in the community is that um, Google, Microsoft, any of the search engines place more validity on what somebody else says your content is than what you say, because you can put anything on there. So creating an alliance of other organizations that deal with similar issues that can share your content when it's posted with links that really properly identify it so that those key search terms or phrases are pointing to your content helps bring that to the front of search results a lot faster. And that external marketing portion with partners um, is often forgot as part of the SEO strategy. That's, that's a very good point. And a lot of the highest ranking factors in search engine optimization in terms of getting your site seen have something to do with whether your link to your page is being uh, used somewhere else, um, social media, or, or a whole variety of ways that it can be used. But essentially that someone else has seen your stuff is important. Um, that's a good point. Uh, Angela, on, on your website, is there any specific content marketing that um, you've been pursuing that's maybe been helpful or maybe has been a learning experience in another way? Um. I wouldn't say that we're very experienced in this. I would say that the best, the best content marketing that I've been able to do has been um, sort of around um, pushing, you know, promoting specific pieces of content at, at different times of year. Like this is always a really good time um, for us to promote any information about um, free income tax assistance. So um, things like that that, that uh, will get picked up by um, lots of other groups because of the timeliness, tend to do best. It, that's, that's a really good point, and it's great low-hanging fruit. Um, not only seasonal, if you know your own seasonal trends for what, um, when people react to what kinds of messages, that's a great way to just sort of have um, uh, sort of elemental marketing. More people will just basically find your materials. You can also tie uh, messages to uh, um, uh, current trends, current news, um, you know, uh, with some of the uh, changes in immigration law, for instance, uh, Immigrant Legal Resource Center changed some of their language and words to and, and offerings around that, um, getting a lot more hits um, to their content as a as a result because a lot of people were focused on that issue. Um, so seasonality and current events, um, sort of basically jumping on the bandwagon of a, of another popular thing is. It's not a bad idea and can be low-hanging fruit. Um, so 
uh, again, so content can take a lot of work. Content marketing is one piece of that work of just sort of how are we going to strategically get this stuff out um, you know, after we figured out that we can write it. Um, and then um, what, what you, you know, another trend, and this is especially a trend as content management systems like Drupal, WordPress, Clone, Joomla, a lot of these tools we've mentioned um, have taken off. Um, they've made it easier and easier to kind of reuse content. Um, this is done in a lot of common ways, but what, what one common way is um, you might write an article, um, maybe it's a press release, and, and you write that article and you save it to your website. And your website, because it's smart and it's a content management system, has been programmed uh, by you um, and your team to show that press release, you know, maybe the top three on your home page, maybe there's some other page because the press release relates to a certain program. It's also on the side of that program page. It's all done automatically. The content's being reused sort of in different parts of your site. You've done it once somewhere, and the site knows to put it other places for you. Um, and that's a very common way to get legs underneath your content. Um, you, you know, a, a, another way to, to reuse content is um, to take a story that you've written in the past and simply, um, you know, bring it to the surface with an update. Um, a lot of stories we write and a lot of information and services we provide are timeless in the sense that we're going to continue to provide them, but they become relevant based on some modern issue, some current trend. Um, or some season or something of that nature. So you can bring it back to the surface with maybe a little bit of text change to, uh, to make it, uh, you know, useful again. Um, uh, it, are, are these strategies, uh, 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 Angela, that um, you've been using on the site that you built in terms of sort of replicating and reusing content? Um, we definitely do replicate and reuse content in, in a couple of different ways. Um, just in some simple ways, you know, uh, many of our articles or common questions are applicable to different situations, and there's a lot of crossover in the subject areas. Um, so we reuse content in that way. Um, in terms of sort of bringing things back to the front, um, whenever we update content um, due to changes in the law, we try to publicize that just as a way of educating people, you know, this law has changed, um, letting them know that A, we're up to date, but also B, reminding them that this is an area of law that they can get help with on the Michigan Legal Help website, and C, is a way of educating them about how, you know, how laws change and the impact that it might have on their lives. Um, our expungement law recently changed in Michigan to broaden the category of people who are eligible to expunge convictions. and so. We, find, we just got all of our materials updated and we want to do um, a campaign, even though it's not new content because it's newly revised, we can sort of, you know, bring it to the forefront again. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Those are, those are good strategies. Um, Brian, um, what do you see in the, in the community in terms of reusing content? Are there other strategies folks are using or ones that you found compelling? I mean, this is definitely uh, something that I've seen people do after they create content for a site like YouTube is then take as there's relevant news issues or uh, related topics and then bundle those together. So if there's a big case that covers um, unfair debt collecting practices and they've got a video that covers how consumers can protect themselves, they'll talk about the recent news article and then take that content evergreen content that relates and put those together as a way to really drive traffic to that content. I think it's a, it's a very good strategy. Agreed. And that, that's, that's, um, that I've seen that work across sectors as well. Um, so I mean, re reusing content, you spent so much time writing the content and getting it ready and marketing it. You definitely want to use it as much as you can. Um, you know, you don't want it to be stale. But usually, with a little uh, a little bit of polish, um, it can be used again. It can be replicated across sites and other sites as well. Um, so, so, so think about that. Good. Well, that brings us to um, the uh, the end here. I just wanted to point out a couple things. Um, 
I'm an expert trainer with Idealware, um, and Idealware.org does have um, a lot of resources on it, including we've mentioned some content management systems. We didn't get into the technical weeds, but if folks get more interested in those systems and what they can do, uh, you can go to Idealware.org and read more about um, what those systems are and how they might help you if you're thinking about building a site. And there's other sort of more strategic pieces on web design um, development for nonprofits that's on um, idealware.org. Let me just um, chat that in here. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to say before I pause for questions. This is my email address. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy for anybody if I said something confusing or weird or you just had a question, feel free to email me. Um, happy to answer any questions uh, that have come up. Um, in the meanwhile, with the about eight minutes we've got left, um, are there um, questions, thoughts, that, um, that folks had on, on what's been said or, or things we haven't covered. I also just wanted to let people know that there is a survey link in the chat over on SurveyMonkey. If you've got any feedback for us on this training, we'd be happy to hear that. Our training calendar is also posted uh, for the rest of the year on uh, lsntap.org, and we uh, have a Google calendar that individuals can subscribe to. Great. Great, excellent. So feel free to um, chat in your questions. If you've got a few here, I'll hang out here. Um, and or you can uh, use star six to unmute if you'd like to speak it out. Give everybody a few minutes because sometimes the writing is like furiously writing a paragraph as you're trying to get into the chat box. <laughs> All right. I think, I think maybe we've, we were perfectly answered all the questions. Well, maybe not, maybe so, but um, if you guys do have questions, um, I put my email in there. Um, feel free to um, follow up after this. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Brian and Angela, uh, especially for all the input and insights, uh, how this stuff um, applies, especially to the legal services community. I think that was really helpful, and it was great to hear all that. Um, and then thank everybody for attending today. Um, hope you guys got a lot out of it. Please do fill out that feedback form. Um, and thank you so uh, much, wish Eric. you guys the best of luck. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone for attending. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Angela. And thank you, everybody who came out. If you have any questions, also feel free to contact myself at um, LSMTAP. I'll put my email address here in the chat. Um, but myself and uh, the uh, LSNTAP intern and Ket are happy to do research for people and get back to them on specific questions, or we're happy to talk to people and give them feedback over their website and ways that we can help improve it. Thank you guys so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Take care, everybody.